Giving is important because uh, eating is truly one of the essentials. We talk about God, we talk about Jesus, we talk about the Bible, we talk about the church, all the other things that we've talked about uh, in recent weeks. Uh, but faith and repentance and mm -hmm. baptism, giving is, uh, is that important because it's truly how we sacrifice to God. We believe God is creator of all things. We believe everything belongs to Him. And we, we've got to uh, live that example out. And that's why giving is included in this, in this series of lessons. Um, stewardship, that term, stewardship, it covers various phases of Christian responsibility, such as the giving of time and talents, as well as material blessings. Um, Tonight, we're going to look at um, stewardship as God's teaching on man's worship through the giving of money. So what does the Bible say about us worshiping God through the giving of material uh, funds, money? Because God's Word says a lot about it. Tonight, we're going to look primarily uh, throughout, almost exclusively here, throughout the Old Testament. And that is by design. So... Uh, an important principle that we get into as we start off is, is this point. Whose is it? God's. Everything belongs to God. So we read for us uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 10 verse 14. The Lord your God belongs to the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. To the Lord your God. Everything belongs to Him. What about this verse? Here in Psalm 24 verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Moses said it, David said it in Psalm 24, also in Psalm 50. Uh, somebody read these verses for us. We can't read all this stuff, we just found it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're every animal on the forest of mine, and the cat walk, thousand years. No ever bird in the mountains, the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, the world is mine and all that is in it. Everything belongs to who? Uh, it's God's world. He created it, He made it, uh, and it belongs to Him. Uh, part one of our lesson, we've got five different items, items A through E on page one of your outline, uh, and it says certain things specifically belong to God. First off, the Bible teaches us in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. It's very that for us. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The silver and the gold belong to who? At one time, as you know, our currency was exclusively, at one time, it was exclusively backed by uh, the value of gold and gold in the Federal Reserve and uh, so forth. God is saying all the money, all the silver, all the gold belongs to who? God. He said, well, for a preacher, I've done my work. The wages of sin is death, but the wages of hard work is paycheck. And they give me a paycheck. And I took it to the bank. It's my bank. It's where I do my bank. And I took it to the bank. I put the money in the bank. I deposited it in the account. It's got my name on it. It's got my name on the account of the bank. I mean, I made money. I worked. I made the money. I took it to my bank. Put the money in the bank. And it's my money. And I got a checkbook. I proved it. It's what I got. Do you have this right now? How much, how much of that money you can take with you when you're dead and gone? Right. <laughs> not, not a single one. Ain't you ever seen a hearse with a luggage rack? Anybody? No, you ain't. Because you, you, you don't get to take nothing with you. So it's really not, it's not even your money. And that, that word we have from a little tiny kid, they know the word mine. It's my toy, it's my movie, it's my whatever. Mine, mine, mine. Little kids get it real fast. And I'm not sure the rest of us grow out of it. Mine. My money. My stuff, my house, my car, mine. What does the Bible say? Whose is it? It's not even ours. It's God's. He just lets it part a little bit for a little while. And he, lets you, he lets you keep a little bit of his money in, in, in an account somewhere. It's got your name on it, your number on it, but who's it belong to? It's his. It's not even yours. So when it comes to it, you say, uh, well, it's all his anyway. David, King David, just before you know, David had a desire. Um, David had a desire to build the temple of God. Uh, and God said, you're not the one. you got blood on your hands. You're not the one to build it, but your son will build it. Solomon, son of David, did build the temple. It was magnificent. 
But David gave a huge, uh, tremendous offering. Uh, the value of gold and the talents of gold, it escapes me exactly, but it's in the billions, if not trillions of dollars. I mean, it was huge. And what he said there in the book of Chronicles, he said, everything, everything in here is here, it belongs to you. And how can he give a value of billions, if not trillions of dollars? How can he give that value for his son to one day build a temple? Because he knew it all belonged to him. It wasn't his gold, it's God's gold. All the silver and all the gold is who? It's God. He has the silver, he has the gold. What else he had? Somebody read Ezekiel 29, 9, 4. Jehovah had said, Behold, I will give you the river is mine, and I have made it. Even the river is his. Even the Levi's of Fork and Big Sandy. Even that. Why gets us into repairing rights uh, and this uh, water rights? And if a river meanders, now the middle of the stream, now who owns that property now? When the river meanders, it gets some bank out. And, so you have a, we go to court, man. I've been there. I've studied that for. But what's the Bible say about who the river belongs to? Even the Nile River, even the Amazon River. They got the piranhas down there. It was my four year old. He came through the house coughing this week and he said that he coughed a little bit. And he said, uh, Is he Graham? He said, I, I think I've got the coronavirus. <laughs> That's the wrong word. That's the wrong word, little buddy. Uh, but uh, the prawns live down in the Amazon. The Amazon, the Nile, the Big Sandy, all the river, even the river. The river's belong to who? They belong to God. What about the land? Leviticus 25, 33. Whose land belong to? And the land shall not be sold in the... Uh, for the or, or the land is mine. It's not to be sold. Perpetuity is perpetual, forever. It, it's not to be sold just in perpetuity. But why? The land is whose? So he's got all the river. He's got all the gold, all the silver. He's got all the land. Well, what about land? At least we got the souls. At least we got our own souls, right? Yeah, like this right here. What's the Bible say in Ezekiel 18, verse 4? Behold, also, souls are mine, as the soul of the Father. So also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul is His. The rivers, the land, the silver, the gold, every soul is His. What about our very bodies? What's the Bible say about that? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were uh, bought at a price. Therefore, <laughs> Even our bodies belong to God. So, so what do we have? What, the rivers is, the lands is, the silver and the gold is his, our souls are his, our bodies are his. So, so why is it when we read through this Bible that God thinks that he can tell us what to do with what we've got? Because we ain't got nothing. It all belongs to him. It's all his stuff. And truly, uh, I read that years ago and uh repeated it many times here, but uh, you, you wake up in, in God's house. You're sleeping in God's bed. You use God's sheets on your bed. You, you get up and you, you go through the bathroom. You use, uh, through the house, you use God's bathroom. He wants you to flush. <laughs> the Bible does say that. You, you cover up your excrement. That's what it says in the book. In the, we read that in our Bible reading. Uh, uh, you drive to work in God's car. You cheer on God's team. Wildcats. You, uh, it's, it's God's stuff. It's all, it's all God's stuff. And when we get that right, then this idea of stewardship, it really, really fits in. When we give back, it's, it's all His. More, it's all His. He don't need our money. But He does tell us how to handle our money. If, if you don't handle your money, your money will handle you. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So uh, everything belongs to God. That is the pinnacle when it comes to stewardship. It's the pinnacle of everything else we do. We're studying about talents, we're studying about time, or we're studying about money. Uh, moreover, we've got to realize stewardship. Stewardship, point number two, is of great importance. Um, everything belongs to God. God owns it. And uh, we have to see how we've got to handle as stewards. He gives us stewardship. Uh, man was given dominion over God's handiwork. As the, as the King James says. Reminded of a great preacher named Chuck Dowdy. Chuck Dowdy's uh, done great work in the kingdom. He's preached the prayer clinic many times down through the years. He, he was in Ohio for a while. He's been in 
Virginia, Winchester, Virginia for 30 years or so, just retired a couple years ago, but done great work. He was also a gold glove boxer. Uh, they call him the wild man, wild man Chuck Dad. And uh, he's done great work. He's a little wild. But uh, they went fishing up in Canada with a group of guys. And asked him to pray for breakfast. He prayed and asked the Lord to bless uh, breakfast that was prepared. They said, Chuck, said, you, didn't, you didn't ask God to bless us to catch fish. He said, oh no. He said, God made the fish. He gave us dominion over the fish. If we can't catch them, it's our fault. That ain't his fault. <laughs> God gave us dominion over his handiwork. So stewardship. And hear this idea. Consider this thought. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3. Consider what the Bible says here. The ox knows his master. The donkey is his own master. But Israel does not know. Now people do not understand. And, and notice the, the ox knows. The donkey knows. But Israel does not know. In Israel, as we study in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6. All the Israel of God. It's no longer it's no longer those who were descendants of Abraham. The Israel of God, as it occurs in Galatians chapter 6 in the New Testament, is the Christian. The Christian, all of us, Galatians 3 says, all of us who put on Christ, all of us who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you've put on Christ, you belong to Christ. If you belong to Christ, Galatians 3 verse 29, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. Who's Israel of God? Who is? You is. We is. Israel of God, it's us. When we read this verse, the ox knows, even the animals know. The donkey knows. He knows his mind. But how can we as the children of God, how can we not know? How can we not understand? God's goodness, God's love, it's all his stuff. And he's allowed us to be stored over. Jesus taught about stewardship in several places. Um, one such place is Matthew 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. It's rather lengthy. But that is uh, uh, the, the parable about the talents. Each man was given a certain number of talents and instructed to use them to benefit the king in the parable. And uh, you remember the guy with ten talents, he made ten more talents. The guy with five talents made five more talents. The guy with one talent, he went and dug a hole, buried his money, and didn't do nothing. And the man with, who gained ten talents, he was rewarded. The man who gained five talents was rewarded. And the man who buried his money, he wasted, he wasted his talent. He was cursed and, and thrown out. And uh, we hear what, what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says this, Peter does, he says, As each has received a gift, employ it for one another as good stewards of God's grace. When we, get, we use God's gifts as He's given us. He's given us gifts, we use them for His glory then we do that um, as the as stewardship of God's grace. And that's the way it works. We truly are stewards of what God has made. Um, man's relationship, man's relationship to his money, reading here from the book, man's relationship to his own money and his God, your relationship with your money and your God, it becomes clear in the line of these two principles. Those two principles being God's ownership of all things. Number one, God's ownership of all things. That may come into play in those two. Number one, God's ownership of all things. And number two, man's stewardship of the things which God gives him. Man owns nothing. Everything he has comes directly or indirectly from God. Man is only the caretaker of the material blessings that God provides. Man is not to use uh, his God, what God gives him as he pleases. Rather, what God blesses him with constitutes a trust in which he is to handle these things as God, the true and rightful owner, pleases. We can't do what we want to do. We've got to do what God wants us to do. That's the idea of being children of God. That's what the law of Moses, we're reading through, that's what the law of Moses described. Be holy, I, the Lord your God, am holy. And there are all these extensive rules which nobody can keep, but Christ alone. Now we're saved by grace, but still, we're no longer slaves to sin. We're slaves, Romans 6, verse 17, slaves of righteousness. Hebrews 12, verse 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We've still got to do what God says. We've still got to be good stewards of what He's provided. Part 3 on your outline. Um, examples, examples of giving. 
Bible tells us this. So we're going to read from 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. God richly provides us with everything for our people and such, a, such an important verse. And that's an excerpt from that verse. And what it says in its entirety, it says those who are rich should not put their hope in money, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything. For what? Our enjoyment. God, God wants us to enjoy what He's made, and what He blesses us with. He wants us to enjoy it. That's one of the promises when you read Deuteronomy 28, and what happened in the law. For obeying the commands of God, they enjoyed God's blessings. God provides us. That's a good verse to underline. And, and put your Bible and go back to it and study it. That first part of that chapter there, 1 Timothy 6, is about stewardship, about money, contentment, and so forth. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Moreover, we also see this in James 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like where does every good and perfect gift come from? It comes from where? It comes from God. It all belongs to Him and every gift comes from Him. So we look at what God has given. Number one, God gave us His Son. Somebody can say praise the Lord. I don't know if you want to. Praise the Lord. John, uh, John 3.16 is not on the screen, but uh, somebody quote it for me. What does John 3.16 say? Amen. It's God who loved the world and what He did. He gave us and He gave us His Son. God's, God, look, we're talking about stewardship of what God's made. Well, look, look at the way God gives. God gave us His Son. Number two, God gives us eternal life. Somebody read Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift of God is what? Eternal life in who? Christ. Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at what God gave us. He gave us the Son. He gives us eternal life. Uh, we cannot buy it. We cannot earn it. We, we can only humbly accept it. It's a gift that comes from God in Jesus Christ. God gave us His Son. God gave us eternal life. God gives us salvation from sin. Paul told this to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 2, verse 8. Somebody read that for For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. What Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, it's not with silver or gold that you have been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. It's by grace. You couldn't do it. You couldn't earn it. You couldn't accomplish it. By grace you have been saved through faith. Because you believe. Your faith is counted as righteousness. He gave us His Son. He gives us eternal life in Christ. He gives us salvation from sin. And He also gives wisdom. So let me read James 1 verse 5 for us. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, does that hit anybody besides me between the eyes? Anybody? That he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. We may ask God for many things in which, his, uh, which in his wisdom he may refuse to give us. But James assures us that if we will ask for wisdom, we shall receive it. This is a gift from God that we should constantly seek. In your personal prayer time, you're not asking for wisdom. That's either because you don't think you need wisdom or maybe you don't fully understand it. God tells you to ask for it. But in your personal prayer time, we should have wisdom on our lips. Lord, give us wisdom. What to do, what to say, how to act, how to react, how to live. Give us wisdom. The Bible says if we lack wisdom, we should ask God. Moreover, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, I'm going to read this for us. Well, you know the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, that through he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. Look at what happened here. Um, Christ was rich. He was rich. He was in heaven. Without him was not anything made that has been made. He was with God. He was with God. He was with God. Was God. He was rich. He was in heaven. He made everything. 
For our sakes he became what? Poor. Notice his example. Notice God gave you. Gave you son. Gave eternal life. Gave grace. Christ had, was rich. He became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become what? Rich. Through his poverty. How will we become rich through his poverty? Is we obey his commands. Because of his poverty, what he accomplished on earth, the word became flesh. He conquered sin. He conquered the grave. Through his poverty, we become rich. How do we become rich? Because that, that account I was talking about at the bank, I don't have that much money in there. How do we become rich? We got eternal life in Christ. The bank can't hold that much money. And, and the world can't handle it that much uh, glory. There are many mansions in my father's house. We become rich through what? It starts with F, it ends with A. We become rich through faith, believing uh, the words of God. Through his poverty, we become rich. This is the way God gives. He gave his son, gave eternal life, gave us salvation, he gives us wisdom. And now let's look at uh, giving in the Old Testament. Individual giving, that is bringing a gift or an offering to God, is a practice almost as old as the history of man. We read about the creation of the world in Genesis 1, and, and there in verse 26 and 27, God made them male and female. Genesis 2 gives a little more detail of that story. Genesis 3 is the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Genesis 4, two of Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, they brought gifts to God. Now Cain, Cain brought what he came to bring. Cain killed Abel, what did Cain bring? He brought, he brought a gift to the soil of the land, what his harvest produced. What did Abel bring? The blood sacrifice. One brought uh, the gifts of the soil. It was rejected. The blood sacrifice was accepted. Cain got so mad. God said, sin's crouching at your door. And because of that, Cain killed Abel. He's angry. He didn't control it. He killed, he killed his brother. But notice, almost as old as the history of man is the idea that you bring gifts personally, you bring gifts to God. Um, that's where we start, Cain and Abel. Um, I don't know if I have, I didn't have that verse on there. Uh, it talks about, from Genesis 4, it talks about it in Hebrews 11, verse 4, when it says, Abel by faith offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. But still, we have this idea of bringing gifts to God. Moreover, uh, you have Noah. When Noah got out of the ark, what's one of the first things he did? He built an altar. What did he do on that altar? He made sacrifices to God. Cain and Abel brought gifts to God. Noah, when he got off that boat, it rained for how long? 40 days, 40 nights. 40 days, 40 nights. How long were they on the boat? Anybody know? I'm, I'm wanting to say... This is from, I was thinking it was 180, but it, the 150 is in there too. Daddy, look it up. What's it say, man? Genesis should be about, what, seven or eight Genesis? Something like that. Um, David will tell us right here in just a second. But Noah, when he got out of the boat, what did he do? He brought gifts to God. Cain and Abel to Noah. It was Abraham. Abraham, if you remember, when you read through Genesis, his nephew, Lot, uh, Lot had been captured. Four kings defeated five kings. And when they defeated five kings, they took spoil. Part of the spoil they took was Abraham's nephew, Lot. Abraham then, with 318 men raised, born in his own house, servants of Abraham, he was a rich man, Abraham. Let that sink in for a minute. Abraham, who had the promises of God, was also a rich man in materials. Abraham, who had 318 men raised in his own house, he went and conquered these kings, gave them a good woman. That's what the Bible says. And of all the spoil that Abraham got, when he was heading back, back to his homeland, he met a man, and we've talked some about this, this series of lessons. His name was Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest of Salem and king of God Most High. No, king of Salem. Totally backwards. King of Salem, which was early word and phrase for Jerusalem. King of Salem and priest of God Most High. He was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. What was he to Salem? He was king of Salem and priest. Priest and king. That is a foundation. 
A foundation is laid. You're reading through the law of Moses. You know that uh, when I say you're reading through the law of Moses, many of us are in that Bible reading plan. I encourage everybody to jump in there. But many of us are in there. We're reading through uh, the Levites. That was Moses and his family. He's actually his older brother Aaron. The Levites were the priests. All the priests were under the law of Moses. Levites. The kings, later on, when they asked for a king, firmly established David's kingdom, the kings came from the tribe of Judah. The priests came from Levi, the kings came from Judah. The priests came from Levi, the kings came from Judah. For somebody to be both priest and king, Melchizedek. Abraham had defeated these four kings. He had all kinds of spoil. He's going back home and he meets this man, Melchizedek. Melchizedek was both priest and king. And Abraham, Father Abraham, had the promises of God. Abraham gave a tenth of everything that he had to who? It starts with male and with his dad. Male his dad. And that's why it's strange. It's a strange encounter. How, how, could, how could Abraham, who had promises of God, give gifts to somebody else? Who's greater than Abraham? Some people assert firmly that Melchizedek was Christ in the flesh. Well, we talked about that some a uh, little bit before in our Bible study. Uh, you could almost uh, take it or leave it until you read Psalm 110, verse 4, and you see the same thing. Another priest and, and king in the order of Melchizedek. You get over to Hebrews, you read Hebrews chapter 7 and following, and you read about Jesus Christ. He is. He's king of kings and lord of lords, but he's also a permanent priest forever in the order of who? Starts with male, ends with Kizadeh. It's a big deal. All I'm, I'm telling you a lot of background here about Abraham, what happened. For one purpose, what? Cain and Abel gave gifts to God. Cain and Abel. Noah got off the boat. How long was he on today? Um, it says it quit raining and the water receded and they landed after 150 days, but it was 40 days before he opened the window and then he sent a raven out and then a dove out. There you go. So it's a complex answer. This Joy Johnson said grab 150 days, yeah. but they also waited. So when the ark landed, it's 150 days. So we think of 40 days, 40 nights, but they floated around for a long time after that. And it, then after they landed, they, they waited for a while before they got off, got off the ship. The first thing they did, they, they brought gifts to God. Abraham, when he had this great victory, he, he offered gifts to Melchizedek, paying a tithe, Abraham did. Jacob did the same thing. Read, uh, somebody read for us what Jacob did here in Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22. So that I say, return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God. <clears throat> and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you have given me, I will give you a hint. Jacob made a vow. If you'll be with me on my journey, he got well. He's with him. He went and got his wives. He lived with two wives. And they're made servants. He came back. He had 12 sons. And he actually had 11 sons when he came back. He was born later. But what he promised to God, I will give you everything you bless me with, I will give you how much? A ten. Um, and, and this giving just occurs. We're kind of able to know it just throughout. That's before the law of Moses. Before the law of Moses was this idea of giving to God. And the Bible standard from Melchizedek to Jacob, from Abraham to Jacob, it is a ten. That was the standard. Moreover, so before the law, the tithe existed. And then under the law, uh, the tithe is commanded. Somebody read from Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 33 for us. The tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the tree, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. If a man redeems any of his tithe, he must add a fifth of the value to it. And there's a verse there. Uh, Everything, a tenth of every animal belongs to the Lord. So when it passed under, they passed under the shepherd's rod. You couldn't give the one before the tenth of the one after. God was taking an example. That's the biggest, strongest, most promising land you had. And he was number ten. He went to the Lord. You don't give him the one before, you don't give him the one after. And it would be detestable for people to give a blind sheep or a limb. If it's lame, you wouldn't do that. But yet the people of God did that. The Israelites did that. It's over Malachi. I said, 
If you brought, if you brought your ruler, a, a sheep that was a lame or blind, would he be pleased with you? But yet you brought them to me. See, they didn't always do. They, they kept it in pretense that they're going to keep the tithe, but then they offered God what it didn't cost them nothing. And that's always been detestable to God. Everything belongs to God. He's all powerful. He's worthy of everything. We're stewards of what He's given us. Doesn't God deserve the best? What do you think? Hundred percent. God deserves a hundred percent. God deserves the best. It's commanded here in the uh, in the book of Leviticus. Uh, moreover, uh, we see uh, there was a second tithe as it's in tithe. Uh, I'll read this because this this went along with that quote. Uh, the entire tithe of the herd and the flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rock, will be holy to the Lord. He must not pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If he does make substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. God had this standard, this idea of the tithe in Leviticus 27. Also, um, in Deuteronomy, um, and I, this actually, hold on just a second before we read the next verse. There was a second tithe. In Deuteronomy, uh, the second tithe was to be given out of the nine tenths remaining. It was to be used for sacred meal and eaten as worship as God instructed. That place was later determined to be Jerusalem. And that's where they would, they would give. The Bible gives um, from Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 27, Deuteronomy 12, verses 17 through 19, uh, their specification. That if you lived if the Israelites lived too far from Jerusalem to carry their tithe with them, then they could convert it to money and then purchase food in Jerusalem for their, for their meal. So it was, it was a second. It was the original tithe, the first tithe, and then there was a second tithe. Then, in Deuteronomy 14, verses 28 and 29, there was a tithe of the third year. Where the Bible says, at the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your town so the Levites will have enough. It was, it was multiples giving, just continuous from one to the next. Um, blessings went with the tithe. Notice, and, and blessings went with the tithe and was serving God faithfully. Notice in Deuteronomy 28, the Bible says this. Somebody read it for us. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. And the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your eating crop will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Anybody want to be blessed by the Lord? Anybody? <laughs> if, and Deuteronomy 28 spells out clearly, if you are careful and faithful to obey these commands, then you will be blessed. If you are faithful, then you will be blessed. And blessed in this way. You'll be blessed and, and, and Deuteronomy spells it out. It's extensive. The way they enumerate the blessings God will provide. Moreover, somebody read this for us from Deuteronomy 3, verses 9 and 10. I'm sorry, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. <clears throat> Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new Honor the Lord with your wealth, then your barns will be filled over fire. God is He owns it all. It's all His stuff. He gets the stewardship over. And for those who get a little bit they can and they hoard it all up, they keep it for themselves, don't worry about anybody else, and just leave everybody else hanging out to dry, do you think God's pleased? Well, who, who gave you the ability to work hard? Who gave you strong backs so that you can make live? Where's that come from? Well, who gave you intellect to go to college to get a degree so that you can make a living for your family? Well, where'd that come from? How much do you pay for that? Oh, that's, that's a gift from God, too. Well, why, why is it, well, how much did you pay to be born in America? And land of opportunity. Why are you not born in Haiti where they literally eat mud as a flavoring on dough? Well, how much did it cost you to be born in America? Oh, that was a gift from God, too. So really, what, what do we have is truly ours? And why, why should we act so selfishly with the stuff that God, that belongs to God that He lets us use for a little while? Does it make any sense? Um, I just uh, met with Tony Reed. Y'all know Tony. He, uh, he came what uh, uh, the revival before last, in the spring last year. He preached one night. He's a great, great man of the faith. Uh, 
He preached for uh, 40 years at the Mapleview Church Christ. They grew from uh, from 40, they were meeting in a house, and into a shopping center to close down in Bluefield, West Virginia. And then they, they, they have a place that they, they build a mall right beside of the church building, Mapleview Church Christ says, right at the edge of the mall parking lot, and they ran 400 people. They grew from 40 to 440 years. Great man, God loves the Lord. And he was telling me yesterday, he made me for lunch yesterday, he was telling me about uh, years ago, went up to the prayer Clarence Greenleaf, he said, he said, he said Greenleaf, the, he said, he preached on giving. He said, always on giving. Always, he'd make you feel so bad. He said, you, you'd be felt so bad, you'd be ashamed not to give something. He said, Greenleaf, he said, said, boys, because at that time, at that time, the prayer clinic was for me and I'm you. He said, boys, stand up. We're going to take an offering, stand up, and reach up to the guy in front of you, and you get his billfold, and I want you to take his billfold, and I want you to give the way you always wanted to give. <laughs> There you go. Clarence Greenleaf, I heard this about him. Kevin Yeager told me this last weekend. and said, Greenleaf, if we're going to do something, they need some money, a extensive amount of money, and we're going to build something. I don't know if it was GDI building or whatever was over in Grundy, but uh, they were giving him some flack. They couldn't raise money and this, that, and the other. And he, Clarence Greenleaf, uh, he had a man come in and uh, value every car in the parking lot during Sunday service. And they, they came in at the end of the service, and at that time, back in the day, the value of the cars was, it was you know, two million dollars or whatever, and uh, that was a long time ago. And it was an extensive sum. I mean, they really, really from through the mud. You tell them we don't have the money. You all got two million dollars worth cars out there. Uh, we ain't tried that at this point yet. I don't know if elders go for that, but really did that. <coughs> Proving the power of the point is uh, everything belongs to God. Are we truly given the New Testament? We're not talking about the New Testament tonight, but I will remind you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it talks about the, the grace of giving. And what it says is out of severe poverty, out of severe poverty, I believe it's the Macedonian churches, these churches out of severe, severe poverty gave above and beyond what they were even able to give. And that's called the grace of giving. And... Uh, I can't be the only one in this room that needs reminded of that fact. The grace of giving. So, uh, God, it all belongs to God. When we, when we don't give, when we're stingy and we hoard up this stuff that God gives us stewardship over, this, this is what happens. Uh, God is not happy. Malachi chapter 3, the Bible says this. Somebody read it up. Malachi the prophet, you know, the last book in the Old Testament. Uh, they were hoarding up money themselves. They were not giving freely to God. They were giving God lame sacrifices and blind sacrifices. He wasn't happy at all with people. And the Bible says this in Malachi chapter 3. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Let's see if I will not throw up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Test me. It's the only place in the Bible that says, God says, test me in this and see what will happen. Bring the whole tithe into the house of the Lord. Uh, he wants you to challenge him. That's the way that verse, that the way the verse reads. And uh, everything belongs to him. We're just stewards of it. Uh, so it's on page two, top of page two, question number one. What is the first basic principle of Christian giving? Everything Belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Number one principle. The second principle. The second principle of Christian giving is we are stewards of what God blesses us with. We're just stewards. It all is His. We're just stewards. And uh, stewardship by definition means how you handle somebody else's what somebody else gives you. That's, a steward. That's what your steward does. What somebody else gives you. God, it all belongs to God. He gives it to you. Uh, so we're stewards of it. Number three, summarize the giving under the Mosaic Law. One word to really summarize the main principle there starts with a T. Uh, yeah. It's an I. Yeah. Starts with a D, ends with an I. Um, that. Then, then they gave above and beyond, including going up and buying meals and so forth. If you couldn't take all your time and transfer, uh, convert it to money that you could carry and buy your meals there. 
But there were several gifts and offerings continually you're giving to God. Um, at the bottom of page two, uh, the middle there, <clears throat> for an offering, for an offering, what did Cain bring? Cain brought broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> the first, the fruit of the soil, the fruit of the soil, and Abel bought. He brought, he brought filet mignon. Yeah. <laughs> he brought a blood sacrifice. He brought, brought to a, a gift of the herd. A list, uh, list four things, number two, list four things that the Bible said God owns. Silver and gold, number one. Number two. The rivers. The rivers, number three. Land. The land, number four. Yeah. Want to say that? Souls. Our souls, yeah. Also, uh, with that, Phil mentioned it, and we talked about more than animals, their bodies, and Phil mentioned that verse, uh, every animal of the forest is mine, even a cattle on a thousand hills. And uh, that, that, that verse from uh, Psalm 50 is a good verse when people say, uh, I believe the Bible just word for word means exactly what it says it means. Well, which 1,000 hills does God own cattle on? Because clearly that verse is a, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills means what? He owns all the cattle on all the hills is what it means. So, uh, food for thought there. Number three, you know, his dad was the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High. The, the verse that ties Melchizedek in, before you get to Hebrews 7, is uh, Psalm 110, verse 4. If you want to make a note of that for your own purposes, you can study that out. If you took everything literally that the Bible says, though, the Bible says there is no God. That, that phrase from Psalm 14, verse 1 says that, Phil. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. That's a, that's a really Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the script, what are these scriptures, the scriptures here, that, what do these scriptures say that God gives us? James 1, verse 5, what does it say God gives us? Wisdom. Wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. He gives generously to all without mind and thought, and it will be given to him. James 1, 5, gives wisdom. Romans 6, verse 23, what does God give us? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, verse 23, God gives us eternal life in Christ. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, what does God give us? I said, y'all don't that in the Bible. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, anybody remember? Anybody got a Bible, look it up. He gives us everything for what? For our enjoyment. For our enjoyment. God richly blesses us with everything we have for our enjoyment. And there are, there are groups of people, there are many Christian people, you know, you want to believe in, the, you know, one man and one woman and, and so forth and sexual uh, purity and things and you don't believe in taking drugs and you don't believe drunkenness is a sin and you don't want anybody to have any fun. The Bible says God gives us everything we have for our enjoyment. God wants us to enjoy everything he's made. And Christians, we I, we got to have more fun than than who has more fun than we can do. I don't I don't think anybody does. I don't think anybody hung over on Saturday morning going to have any more fun than I'm gonna have. If we're out here at East Point washing the building down on Saturday morning. Hey, they ain't having any more fun than we are. We can remember what happened on Friday night. Uh, think, think about it. Um, God gives us this stuff for our enjoyment. Number five. Israel. Israel gave the first tithe to the King of Salem. Well, Abraham did that. He gave it to the King of Salem. Abraham gave the first tithe to the, if you remember, and, and this was, uh, I'm not sure we read it on the, I mentioned it, I think, but I didn't, I don't know if we read, put it on the board. Um, Israel gave the first tithe to the Levites. The Levites, if you remember, the priesthood, they didn't have, if you and we're seeing that when we go through our Bible reading. The Levites did not get a portion of land as their inheritance. So the Israelites were commanded to get a tithe so that the Levites would be provided for. The Levites, as they served in, in the priesthood, 
They had no means to survive except for the rest of the community bringing the tithe to the Lord. So the the uh, Israel gave first to the Levites because they had no what? Land. land. They had no, had no inheritance of land. So that was important. And that's, that's there are groups of Christian people. I believe it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Mormons. The Mormons believe that you cannot, thou shall not pay a man to preach the gospel. But over in 1 Timothy 5, it says, don't love the ox while it's trading in your grain. And that, that is speaking exclusively to uh, paying, paying ministers to preach the gospel. Paul, Paul received gifts, and one time he was amply supplied because of other people's sacrifice. And he goes back to the Old Testament. That's the way it works. Um, the Levites were given gifts. The tithe belonged to them because they got no inheritance. That's why. Number six. Uh, list three blessings that God promised to Israel in Malachi 10, verse, uh, Malachi 3, verses 10 through 20. Three blessings. Hard to find three there. It just mentions a blessing from here. I will throw open the floodgates. I will pour out a blessing. You won't have enough room to pick. Take it all in. Uh, the whole time, test me so there will be food. There will be food. I'll open floodgates and you won't have enough room to take it all in. Can anybody handle any blessings for God, anybody? We just got to be faithful what He gives to us. And maybe could it be, could it be the case that we have been faithful with God, what God's given us and He would be hesitant to give us more? Bible, the Bible clearly paints it that way through the Old Testament. As we, we talked about and studied many times uh, here before from uh, Luke uh, 3, uh, Luke 6, Luke 6, verse 38, where Jesus said, Give, and it will be given unto you. And people say, Man, if I had as much money as he did, well, I heard preachers say, Hey, if you give like he gave, you might have money to be God. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake them together, and run them over. We'll support you right. Um, anybody got any final questions, comments, thoughts? One at a time, please.